May we pray. Prepare all of our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning is what you just heard, quite frankly. It's Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. There Paul writes, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. There are some of us, not all of us, who, whether we would admit it or not, keep a list. A list of behaviors or characteristics, or hobbies, or activities that we think, if you were a good Christian, you would, or you wouldn't, be doing. Yes, you're a Christian, but if you were a good Christian, you would take your hat off in the Lord's house. Yes, you're a Christian, oh yes, but if you were a good Christian, you would volunteer to be on a committee. No, 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 never, never mind that you have two young children and a full-time job. You'd make time to be on a committee. Well, sure, you may be a Christian, but I mean, a good Christian wouldn't do something so unbecoming as be seen in a tap room. And what's interesting is how culturally specific these lists are. My dad has maintained a relationship with the Rocco St. Mihai Baptist Church in Budapest, Hungary, for the better part of 30 years now. And he often takes groups to assist their congregation with whatever they're doing in the community. I don't like calling it a mission trip because we're not taking a mission over there at all. We're joining them in their mission. And I've been several times. And part of preparing for those trips, especially for folks who've never been, is learning, or for some of us, remembering some Hungarian Baptist taboos. And here's the thing. Brenda, this is why I was telling you it was funny, wherever you are, that you and Rick were saying what you did. Alcohol consumption is a complete non-issue for Hungarian Baptists. Total non-starter. Not just that, they not only don't care if their members drink, they use wine for communion. But don't you dare be caught playing cards by one of those Hungarian Baptists. Don't do it. Now, to be fair, we aren't always malicious and mean about these lists. Some of you, sometimes myself included, are honest enough to admit that you have one in the first place. And sure, you observe people doing faith and living their lives in Christ, and it's not quite how you do it. It's not quite how you do do it, but you try your best to keep your peace about it as best as you can. But then, of course, there are times we're malicious about it. Back when Sarah and I were dating, she'd been coming to church with me a few weeks in a row when we both decided that we wanted to start singing in the choir on Sunday mornings. Now, I had to do it. Because I was an employee of the church, and my dad, this was the big one, was the music minister. So what kind of son would I be if I didn't sing in the choir, if I bailed on dad? But Sarah didn't have to. 
Sarah chose to. And this was everything that this church could have possibly dreamed of. See, the community the church resided in was and is made up of mostly retired folks. And the church mirrors that demographic. And so here comes this beautiful, young, talented woman, not only visiting the church, but joining the choir, volunteering, there's that committee thing, volunteering to be a part of the church's ministries. Now, at that time, Sarah wore a nose hoop, one of those that hung off of one of the nostrils, not the one that's in the middle. And just as an aside, I can't express enough how much I miss that nose hoop. <laughs> I loved that thing. But whatever, teachers have to look professional, I guess. At Sarah's very first rehearsal, nose hoop in tow, amidst all the people who were welcoming her, and greeting her and getting to know her. She hadn't been there that long. One woman walked up to her and made a motion to her nose like this and asks, how do you breathe with that thing? Now Sarah thought this lady was just trying to be funny and so she replied pretty quickly, the same way you do. She didn't know that she'd won the first round <laughs> because that woman turned up her nose and replied, well, it's repulsive and walked away. first week in choir rehearsal. Yes, we can get mighty malicious with those lists. We start saying things like, you've heard it, maybe you've said it, I don't know how you can be a Christian and fill in the blank. As if we're the be-all, end-all determiners of what constitutes a Christian. And what I find interesting about every single one of these lists and what they all have in common is that they are lists that you, whoever you are, just so happen to abide by. So you think a good Christian wouldn't wear a hat in church, and wouldn't you know it? You don't wear a hat in church. You think a good Christian would volunteer for a committees, and how convenient, because you are on committees. And you don't know how you could be a Christian and possibly not vote Republican because, well, you're a Christian. If you vote Republican, these lists end up becoming, when the rubber meets the road, and whether we mean it or not, totally self-congratulatory. A sanctified pat on the back, a way of boasting in our own behaviors and practices, of demonstrating our moral and religious superiority over others, and, by the way, ostracizing those who are not quite as holy as we are. In other words, those lists, these lists that we often think are a demonstration of our piety are in fact nothing more than a demonstration of our pride. There were some in Galatia who were demonstrating this kind of pride. Some call them Judaizers. I'll simply call them Paul's opponents. These opponents of Paul's were Jewish Christians who had come to Galatia with a message for Gentile believers, which just means not Jewish, that sounded a lot like some of our lists. To be a real believer, to truly be a part of and integrated into the people of God, you must be circumcised according to Jewish custom. The men should. Never mind if, well... You're not Jewish. And never mind if you're an adult man. And I'll just let the men in the room have ears to hear there. If Gentile Christians want in, they must, as Paul puts it in Galatians 2, live like Jews. And indeed, some of these opponents discouraged sharing the Lord's table with these Gentiles unless they had been circumcised. So it wasn't enough that you weren't meeting our criteria. We will not fellowship with you until you do. It's odd how those lists have a way of becoming so divisive. Paul has no patience for such teaching. He calls his opponent's message 
numerous things, quite frankly. You pick one. A different gospel, Galatians 1, verse 6. A distortion of the gospel of Christ, Galatians 1, verse 7. A nullification of the grace of God, Galatians 2, chapter 21. And perhaps even worse, a yoke of slavery, Galatians 5, verse 1. A yoke of slavery. We'll miss out on that, but it's a brutal play on words. Because the image of a yoke was often used, in the Jewish tradition anyway, in a positive sense, to describe discipline that guides us in the way we should go, provided by the teachings of the law, among which circumcision was one of the preeminent ones. And so Paul's opponents may have spoken of circumcision in this regard, a divine gift. It's not oppressive. It's a means by which we can become a part of God's people. Don't you want to be a part of God's people? But Paul takes the metaphor and flips it on its head. As Richard Hayes writes in his commentary of Galatians, he depicts the yoke not as a privilege, but as a symbol of enslavement. And so often I think these lists of ours are the same. In our pride and in our hubris, we think that our unsolicited advice is somehow a gift to the less privileged and the less disciplined. But in reality, all we're doing is oppressing people with our preferences. Paul continues his assault, accusing his opponents in the passage we've just heard of wanting to make a good showing in the flesh and desiring to boast in the flesh of their Gentile converts at convention later. These criticisms are a big deal coming from Paul. Because if Jewishness is next to godliness, then Paul's as godly as they come. You've heard of my former life in Judaism, he writes in Galatians 1, how I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. He unpacks this religious resume a little more in Philippians chapter 3. He writes, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. If anyone at all was entitled to boast in their religious superiority, it was Paul. But he doesn't. And not only does he not boast, he completely refuses. The idea is reprehensible to him. Indeed, as he puts it in Philippians 3, he writes that he counts all of his ethnic pride and personal achievement as a complete loss. And if I may be crude for just a moment, because this is the way the Greek works, that word that he uses for loss is the word we would use for, oh, how to put it, going number two. And that's what Paul thinks about his ethnic and religious superiority. Because the gospel is not about the lists that we conform our lives to. The gospel is not about the ways in which we try to satisfy the oppressive expectations of others. The gospel is not about performance or presentation. Because if it were about any of these things, it would not be by grace. The gospel is about one thing. And it's the one thing worth boasting in, and it's the thing that we have made the center of our attention for this entire Holy Week. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, far be it from me to boast. The last thing on earth I ought to do is boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at one level, this is a paradox, which means a contradiction. It doesn't make sense to speak of boasting in the cross because it involves boasting in something that we had nothing to do with. It would be like y'all telling the choir a good job singing, and I said, you're welcome. Thanks. But that's exactly Paul's point. Paul is not interested in receiving honor for anything he's done. His interest and indeed his honor is what God is in what God has done. The cross is God's doing, not ours, never ours. To boast in the cross is not to boast at all. 
It is to worship God for what He has done on our behalf. It is to celebrate the self-giving love of Jesus. It is to acknowledge that even our best efforts lead only to death. And that no matter how rigorous our personal lists are, they are wholly incapable of securing our salvation. On Easter Sunday, and indeed every Sunday after that, we join Paul in boasting in the cross of Jesus Christ. This is and will forever be the heart of the Christian message. And we celebrate with him the fact that in the cross, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This is the verse on which Paul's entire argument in the book of Galatians hinges. In the cross is not just the salvation of souls, significant and amazing as that is, but the death and resurrection of the entire cosmos. And this is not a matter of perception, like the way we say we worked ourselves to death by doing yard work. This is a matter of reality. In the crucifixion of Jesus, the world marked by sin, division, ugliness, pride, anger, and rivalries, what Paul calls in Galatians 1, this present evil age has been put to death. And us with it. But to die to the world means we are liberated from that world. We are no longer governed by its principles. We no longer play by its rules. We are, as Eugene Peterson puts it in his translation of this passage in the message, set free from the stifling atmosphere of pleasing others and fitting into little patterns that they dictate. We who are in Christ, who have been justified in, in His death, and by, justified by faith, excuse me, in His death and resurrection, live in a renewed world where, as Paul puts it, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. A new creation where for freedom Christ has set us free. A new creation where the cross of Christ is sufficient for salvation and where we are no longer accountable to people's oppressive lists, but to the fruit of the Spirit against which there is no law and through whom we ourselves are now made new. When Paul has this reality to boast in, why would he boast in anything else? What do you boast in? What are the things you think brings you honor? Are you trying to make a good showing in the flesh, still enslaved by the yoke of public opinion, or will you join Paul in boasting in nothing else than the cross of Christ? One way to make sure we are doing the latter is to make our prayer this morning and for the rest of our days the one voiced by Isaac Watts in the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood.